morning. Welcome to St. Luke. We're so glad that you're here. Would you please join us and stand and worship this morning? seated for children's time. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I almost tripped and fell. Good morning, I'm glad you're here, come on down. That would have been a great way to start, Miss Susan falling on the steps, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not really. 
Okay, we just coming out of the Christmas season, and I want to know how many of you watched the movie The Grinch? Raise your hand if you watched The Grinch. Yeah, lots of people? That's a good one, isn't it? Now, do you remember what problem The Grinch had? Yes? His heart was three times too small. His heart was three times too small. Good, you said that with very good confidence. We weren't quite sure at the 930 service, were we? We were confused how much too small his heart was. Well, and that small heart caused him to be a pretty grumpy guy, didn't it? It sure did. His heart was too small. What? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. (laughs) Well, there is a verse in the Bible that can help us understand about people. Come on down, Rebecca. And not that they necessarily have a small heart, but people can have a hard heart. And we want God to help people with a hard heart because people with a hard heart aren't very kind and they can be grumpy and it's just not good. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet that God spoke through and Ezekiel told the people that God said this in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, which means a hard heart, and give you a heart of flesh. Now, when God isn't living in our hearts, it's easy for our heart to harden. Rejecting God, pretending he doesn't exist, uh, not believing in him, and refusing to admit that we sin and that we, that we make mistakes, those are the kind of things that make our heart hard. Now, to soften our hearts, we need to read God's word, we need to allow him to work in our lives, and that will help make our hearts soft and loving. Do you all see this heart? Okay, it's a dried up sponge. Let's not get that yet, please. It's a dried up sponge, and it's kind of hard. Yeah? Now, can you feel it? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna, I'll let everybody feel it in just a minute. Now, we're going to make this heart soft. And to make this heart soft, if it was our hearts, we would make it soft by reading God's word, spending time in prayer, coming to church. Let's look. Now look, it's nice and squishy now. It's not hard anymore. It's a little drippy too, isn't it? (laughs) Okay, you can pass it that way, and then we'll pass it that way where you can feel the nice, soft heart. Now, God wants our hearts to be soft so that we can serve others, so that we can care about others, so that we can share his love with our friends. He doesn't want our heart to be hard. He wants it to be soft so we can have a meaningful, good relationship with him and we can serve his people, okay? Let's say this together. God loves me, God is always with me, and God has a plan for me. Let's go upstairs for God's backyard. Where's the heart? Kevin has or Michael has it. Join us in worship.
Let's pray. Our God, as we enter this new year, we come to you. We come with open hearts and we know that we will find you here. Merciful Lord, we confess that we need you. We need your presence. We need your peace. We need your forgiveness. Help us to lay down the things which draw us away from you and forgive us for the times we've fallen short of your will for us. And Lord, help us to also forgive ourselves and others. Sometimes we choose to hang on to hurts, but that's not your will. Your desire is for us to be less burdened by the baggage and burdens in our hearts. You have a glorious life for us, a life of your hope and healing and wholeness, if we will just trust you and receive it. Give us the courage to open ourselves to your work in our lives. Our Lord, the world needs you as well, and so we lift up the needs of our church and our community, of our country and of the world. Let there be peace in war-torn areas and bring healing to those injured and traumatized in the brutality of war. Care for those who need shelter or food. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill or grieving and be with those who are seeking jobs. Encourage those who are burdened by depression or anxiety or with the trials of life. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the many good things in our lives and we thank you for your constant presence and care. We're grateful for the many ways in which you provide for us and we thank you for making us your stewards. We ask your blessing on our offering. We offer it gladly, we give joyfully, and we pray for the ministries and the lives that our offering impacts. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you've brought us into this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, protect us from sin, and in all we do, guide us in the fulfilling of your purpose. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning. It is so good to be in worship together with you. And whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're really glad that you're a part of our family today. If you're our guest, you have our special welcome. We would love to answer questions you might have about the church and help you find ways to connect at the church. So if you take a moment to fill out the connect card that's in the pew back, or you can fill it out online also, we'll follow up with you and would love to help you find your place here. Um, when you complete your card, you can either put it in the offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary, or you can take it to one of the welcome centers where we also have a gift for you. This is a place of hope and healing and wholeness. We're passionate about pursuing Jesus Christ together, and this is a great fellowship that loves well. I have an exciting announcement to share with you, and that is right after this service, make your way down to the gym because we're going to be having a really awesome event called Brunch and Beats. Our fa fabulous pianist Mark Anderson is going to get turned loose and playing the piano, and we'll be offering waffles to snack on as well. It's going to be a really fun time of fellowship and good music together, so be sure to just head down the hall when we finish here in, this, in the sanctuary. And now we have a video. How's everybody? First week of the year? Maybe we better pray first. Here we go. Oh, Lord, thank you. 2024 is here, and you're here, and you're guiding us, and we pray this morning that you would open our hearts to the possibility that 21 days now, from now, we can be a different person. And so, Jesus, start something new in us today. We're grateful for grace. And may it be abundant in this time and season in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this reading from Ezekiel, because I know that's where you spent your morning devotion time. Here we go. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God." And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. A little light reading to get the day going today. You know, <clears throat> before I became a pastor, I was part of a pastor's family, not by birth, but by marriage. Uh, Mandy's father is a Methodist pastor, and his church, or one of them anyway, was located between two cornfields and a bean field. Great pastor. I've learned so much from him over the years. And uh, one Friday, I was going to meet Mandy and her parents, who had done something earlier that day for dinner, and I was waiting in the driveway of their parsonage, and I watched a car pull up and two people get out. I'd never seen them before, and they began to talk and spill their life story. 
And I said, I think you're looking for my father-in-law. He's the pastor. They said, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm just the son-in-law. And they said, no, you'll do. And they just kept right on going. (laughs) And I thought, oh, Lord, what am I into at this point? And so they begin to tell their story, and it was a story of abuse and addiction and adultery. And we got, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes down the road with this, and they said, so what do we do? Because the church that we go to says we're supposed to forgive and forget. And they told us, hey, if you get a divorce, it's, you're both going to hell. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I said, well, you really need to talk to my father-in-law. <laughs> He's the pastor. And they said, oh, you'll do. And I thought, uh, I'm just the son-in-law. I knew their theology didn't work. I knew that the beliefs that they held to, you couldn't really find them or support them by scripture, but, you know, we talked about it, and I said, well, you know, where are you at with Jesus, and what about a counselor? Wouldn't that be a good idea? And so we talked for a few more minutes, and they took off down the road, but it's this question, I think, that plagues us as Christian, and as well as our culture, what do we do with forgiveness? Are we supposed to forgive and forget? Is that really how it works? And we live in this culture of microwave spirituality, don't we? We want a quick fix right now, right here, as quickly as possible. I'll read a book that's fine, but it better not be more than about 150 pages in large type font, and if I can't get through it in seven days at 20 minutes a reading, I really don't want to do this, because that sounds horrible. And in the process, do we miss the deeper things of the heart? That's the question I'd ask. So I have a proposition for you. What if in the next 21 days you could come to grips with what was and what is in your life to embark on what will be. How many of you will take the journey? I'm going to hold you to that. (laughs) You know, I, I think, I think maybe the image we're meant to have for life is something like this. Do you remember when you were three or four, or maybe your kids were three or four, or nieces or nephews or whoever it might be, You watch a kid who's three or four years old in the middle of the summer. Do they have shoes on? Never. They just run. And I I think that's how we're meant to go through life, with that kind of joy, that kind of passion, that kind of purpose, to just run barefooted and, and drink in all of life as life was intended to be and created by God. But that's how we're supposed to function. We don't need shoes. Heck, most of the time, kids are half clothed. They don't care. They're having a great time. And when they're done, if you're anything like me or my son Luke, when, when you're done, you just lay down wherever you're at and you take a nap. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's safe because people have your back. You know what I mean? And then somewhere along the way, we begin to experience life. And you step on a nail your first time or you stub your toe and you put the shoes back on. And you play with the kid down the road who's mean and hits you and you put up defenses and realize at some point you really do have to fight back. And you get into relationships with other people and they bring you harm. And so what it creates is baggage, suitcases. And the suitcases sometimes get really big and we fill them with more and more stuff because we're carrying the baggage and the burdens that we're beholden to. And at some point, you really stop running, you stop walking. In fact, you just end up standing still because there's so much in your life that absolutely gets you weighed down. Ever been there? And so you say your prayers and you talk to friends and you read the books and you make the resolutions and sometimes you feel better, but the reality is that the baggage is still there and you still carry it. And you feel weighed down. And too many people go through life like that. And here's how I know it. I have the best seat every Sunday morning here at St. Luke. And here's what I see. Some. (laughs) And look, I get it. I get it. Okay? Some. And the one that breaks my heart is this one. 
And we've been one of all three, haven't we? So what's forgiveness? Is it really forgive and forget? This is why we need it. Because at some point, we've been that person who's hung our head way down with guilt or shame about what was or what is in the midst of our lives, and we've completely misconstrued what forgiveness is. It's not my bad. It's not it's all good. It's not forgive and forget. It's something radically different. And our typical approaches to forgiveness look something like this. We'd rather just go in and get a stent. Give me the procedure, give me the medicine, give me the thing to open up the heart again. I don't want to really change any of my patterns or behaviors or the way that I eat or the stress in my life. Just get the blood flowing and can we please move on down the road as quickly as possible. And it never deals with the deeper matter of the heart. Or we recognize there's a need for open heart surgery and yet we've gone to Dr. Google and try to do it ourselves. Can you imagine such a thing, doing your own open heart surgery? Those of you who've had it are saying, Brian, you've clearly lost your mind today. But isn't that what we try to do? So we'll go to a counseling session one time, or we'll read the book, and we'll say, hey, I'll make these changes, and yet the changes never really root, and we're still carrying the baggage and the bondage and the burdens all along the way. And what we've missed, whether we want to talk about stents or open heart surgery, is ultimately this, that forgiveness real forgiveness. Forgiveness has to start at the source with a great heart surgeon, and of course, that's God. And that really brings us into our scripture today from the book of Ezekiel, because the people of God were sitting at the rivers of Babylon in the book of Ezekiel. They had lost everything. They had lost their homes, their homeland, their language. They'd lost their culture. They'd lost their freedom. And a great big bully, at least that's what it seemed like to them, had come to their front door, taken their playground, and brought them a couple, about a thousand and five hundred miles away, we'll call it, to the land of what's now modern day Iraq. They lost everything, and they were angry. When somebody hurts us, isn't that an appropriate response? If you don't get angry, I really want to talk to you, because I think you're hiding something. So they were angry, and it's captured, in fact, in Psalm 137, which says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our lears. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you've done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. And you say, how can God say such a thing? That's why I don't read the Old Testament. The reality is you say stuff like this all the time. It just looks different. When somebody hurts you, don't you want vengeance? Don't you want the, settle, the score to be settled or the scales to be even? I imagine you do, and if you look at the headlines of our culture, that's what it's all about. Vindication, they're evil, they'll pay, I will get even. And justice will be served. Doesn't that sound like the culture that we live in? And so it's fascinating to me that we go, Psalm 137, how can that be in the Bible? God is a God of love. Without a doubt, he's also a God of holiness. And I wonder sometimes if the Bible just hits a little too close to home, that we've had and felt and thought the same kinds of things. And so Ezekiel, Ezekiel ends up at the rivers of Babylon. In fact, we're told that in the very first verse of the book, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kabar Canal, which is one of the streams in Babylon that literally ran through the ancient city, the heavens were opened, and I saw, say it with me, visions of God. Notice that the people have an idea of why they're there, the outcome they're stuck in, the consequence is that they lost everything, and yet what God is going to provide is an entirely different vision as to how they got there. And we read this, therefore say to the house of Israel, Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. 
And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Israel thought the reason they were stuck in the place they were, the outcome was that some big bullies came and took their playground. And yet what God shows them is that, no, you've got this completely wrong. There was a process that led you far from me. You've profaned my name. You've denied me. You've denied my ways. You've denied my laws. You've worshipped false gods. You've followed the kings who led you astray. You've completely forgotten who you are. You've ceased to be my creation, Israel, and you became the creation of something or someone else. And sometimes that's what happens, isn't it? That's how baggage accumulates. And it's funny, you know, we say that the Bible is an old and antiquated book when we read that sin revisits the third and fourth generation, except we experience this in real life, don't we? Don't believe me? Talk to a family with untreated addiction in it and the way that it affected the children and their children and the children after that, or abuse and the way the abuse affected the child and then their children and then the children after that. What we tend to do, friends, is we focus on the outcomes and we miss the process along the way that led us to the place that we're at. Don't believe me? Just look at the way that our children and our schools are struggling. And the people whom we've blamed as the teachers, wrong. You want to look for the problem, look to the parents. It's the parents who aren't training their children, who aren't caring for their children, who aren't raising their children, and they're leaving it to a teacher who's supposed to teach English or math, but instead is having to deal with behavioral problems because they're spilling all all over the floor from everywhere because of the brokenness and the bondage that's at home. And you know it's true. I just got in your kitchen the first Sunday of January. And we're watching this manifest itself everywhere. We want to deal with outcomes, and yet we've forgotten the process along the way that it wasn't overnight that somebody arrived at the juncture in which they're at, suffering and struggling and in bondage and brokenness by the rivers of Babylon, weeping. Oh my goodness, how could it be better? And so God gave Ezekiel a vision. You thought it was the bullies that took your playground, and here's what I am here to say to you, Ezekiel. It is not the Babylonians who were your problem. It is your own sin that separated us, which is the issue. You profaned my name and made it unholy and dirty and the process of sin down to the third and fourth and tenth generation. That's why we're here. And that's what God does in its grace. Do you believe this? You're like, that doesn't sound like grace to me. What are you talking about, preacher? When God reveals our sin to us, it's grace. In fact, we call this prevenient grace as as Wesleyan Methodist people. It's prevenient grace that God says, here's the thing, you've walked away from me, but I love you enough to show you what's going on in your life and that this doesn't work. And what he calls us to do is to lament. Lament, Ezekiel. Loathe yourself for your iniquities and your abominations. And just so that when we get to the point that it's so intense we can't take it anymore, God gives us abundant grace. Look at the scripture again. Say it with me. I will. You, you didn't say it loud enough. You, you're not starting right. Who will? I will. Who will? I will? Come on now, I don't believe you. Who will? There we go. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from your idols. And give you a new heart and a new spirit. He's not done yet. We just got to keep going. And help me in the back, friends. There we go. And Remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and 
I will be your God. Yeah. It's really wild. God breaks our hearts for what has broken his. And then in the next sentence, he says, the very grace that you need, I will be faithful to provide it. It's grace that brings us to the place of our brokenness, and it's grace that pulls us from the place of our brokenness to give us a new heart. I will. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will be your God and you will be my people. And what it helps us recognize is that every single man, woman, child, living and breathing person on earth needs a great heart surgeon and that heart surgeon is God. We know this intuitively and the hard part is we're at odds with it. Here's why. We want grace for ourselves. We all want grace, right? That's why we say, don't judge me. We want grace for our, ourselves. I was just misunderstood. It was a blip. It was a bobble. It's a my bad kind of thing. I, I didn't mean that. I, my intentions were good, but it turned out in this, this bad way. I, mm. We want grace for ourselves to be true. And yet the hard part is we want karma to be true for everybody else. Truth? They deserve it. They're evil. God's getting his just desserts. Smite them. Get them. All our culture screams that we should take full advantage of all the freedoms that exist. Do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, wherever you want. It really doesn't matter. And when, when the process leads us to a place of brokenness, the saddest part is this. We claim that there's no God, there's no sin, there's no forgiveness, there's no redemption. And hope that karma is true. And that's why our culture is so angry. It doesn't know how to forgive. It demands accountability and it denies forgiveness and redemption. That's why we're so broken. And that's why apologies that never come lead to vigilantism and people out for justice. We're broken by the rivers of Babylon and we don't even know it. And I'm about to drop some truth on you right now. Here it comes. Some of you are so angry and hypercritical in life because of what was done to you or what you did and you're trying to make up in every single way that you know how to balance the scales. So much so that you hope reincarnation is true or, or Doc McFly's time machine is going to all come to pass for you so you can go back and do it right. And here's the good news for you. If you are weighed down like that, you can't. You can't fix your problems. Not like that. You can't right all of the wrongs. But Jesus has a word for you. You keep trying to do it right. You keep trying to make it right. And yet what the Bible says this morning is, you can't, but he will. He will. He will make it right. And that's what the beauty of the cross is really all about. You see, it's got two pieces to it. There's a vertical piece for what happens between us and God, and there's a horizontal piece of what happens between us and other people. And until you get the vertical piece right, friends, you can't get the horizontal piece right with everybody else. Yes? And so you keep trying to fix your broken relationships, and the problem is, until you get your brokenness straightened away with God, you got nothing to hang the horizontal bar on. I will. Jesus says, our 21st century failure in the understanding of forgiveness is this. We think we have the power to jailbreak ourselves or somebody else for what they did to us. And you can't, but he will. And you get this piece right, and you realize 
that God has forgiven you, then you're able to say, yes, God, help me to forgive others in the same way that you have forgiven me. Will never happen until you get the vertical piece right. It doesn't exist. Because forgiveness without God is impossible. Here's how I know it. Look at him on that cross. And think about the words that he said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And here's the thing, friends. Jesus has been praying that prayer ever since. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. How many people in the sanctuary sometimes don't know what they're doing? And that's why, that's why we need Jesus Christ. Because without him, forgiveness doesn't exist. Without him, you can't forgive others. Did you hear what our great heart surgeon said? I will cleanse you. I will make you clean. I will give you a new heart. I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you, and I will be your God. I asked you a question about 20 minutes ago. What if in the next 21 days you could come to grips with what was and is to embark on what will be in your life? Are you ready? Step one is this simple. You got to get right with the heart surgeon. And I love seeing your beautiful shining face here every Sunday. Please don't misunderstand me, but here's the thing. Just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're sitting right with the heart surgeon. And what he's longing for in your life is this, that you would run to him and run from whatever train wreck you're living in right now. And he will. He will change your life. I guarantee it. He will change your life. He will change your heart. He will help you experience fullness and joy that you've never had. And he will help you be reconciled to the people around you that you might not even like. I'm really excited to announce a partnership that we formed here at St. Luke. Uh, our leadership of the church has uh, formed a partnership with the Interfaith Counseling Center. And so Dr. Rick Landon and some of his associates will be on site a couple of days a week from here moving forward as uh, counselors that you can come to and find healing. Because see, we, we think this is a, a two-part step, and you're going to get this in the rest of the teaching series. We, we think it starts with he will, and we all also recognize there's a component that says we will. And so we would love to walk with you as you work through whatever it is that God wants to work through in your life. And if we can connect you to Dr. Landon or his practice, come and see Nora and I. We will, we will set those wheels in motion for you, and we will walk with you just as God will walk with you. But it starts today. It starts with this vertical relationship between you and God. And if you're ready, if you're ready to make a change, if you're ready for God to begin something new, if you're ready to deal with what was and what is to embark on what will be, then my prayer for you today is simply this, that you would give your heart for the first time or anew to Christ today and let him begin to work. You ready to do that? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are our great heart surgeon. And we recognize that we walk away from you at times. We recognize that there are ways in which we profane your name by the things that we do, by the way that we treat other people. By the way that we live our lives as if you're not even present. And so today at this first Sunday of the year, we pray that you would begin something new. Our simple confession is this, forgive us, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, begin to be at work in my life. Be my Savior, be my Lord. Change me. 
Help me to love you the way that you love me. Help the relationships in my life that are broken to be reconciled. Help me to forgive the person who's hurt me umpteen years ago and I'm still holding on to the baggage of it in my life. Help me to be reconciled to those I've harmed. God, this process of forgiveness, may it begin something new in me today. And as my Lord and Savior, will you be faithful to bring this good work that you've started to its completion? God, we're grateful for the work that you do, for the clean hearts and hands that you give us. And so that's how we approach this communion table this morning, remembering that on the night which you gave yourself up for us, you took bread and blessed it and gave thanks, you broke it, you gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, you took the cup, you blessed it and gave thanks and gave it to them to drink and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to invite those who will be assisting with serving to come forward at this time. And as they do so, I'll share just a few words of instruction. Here at St. Luke, we celebrate an open table, which means that you do not need to be a member of this church to receive communion. Simply come by faith, desiring to know and follow Jesus. Once we've finished the preparations, you may come up to the altar rail if you choose. You may pray at the altar rail as long as you like, and when you're ready to be served, cup your hands and the servers will bring the elements to you. If you prefer, we're glad to serve you in the pew. Just remain there and we'll bring you the elements there. Whether you come to the altar rail or remain in your pew, the server will hand you the bread and then they'll hand you a cup with the juice. Also, we do have gluten-free bread, so if that's what you prefer, please come to the line in the center and there's a plate there that has that for you there. You'll also see that we have green baskets at the altar rail and at underneath the um, offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary. That's because we receive a special offering for our alms ministry on communion Sundays. And that's a ministry that's very important. It serves people in our congregation and in our surrounding community who are experiencing times of financial distress. And so your generosity in that way makes a real difference in people who um, need an extra boost to get through a difficult time. So thank you for your attention to that. The table is prepared. Please come.
Would you please stand and join us in worship? for just a minute so that you can see me. <laughs> it is my tremendous joy and pleasure to celebrate with you some missionaries that we are deploying. Donna and Martin Knox are leaving this week to, for about two weeks of mission work in Lima, Peru, which is also a mission that our church supports through our mission support. And Donna went there about 12 years ago, and it's been on her heart ever since to go back and take Martin with her. So this is an answer to prayer. And Larry and Joy are career missionaries who just keep on going, and they are answering the call to serve in McAllen, Texas, which is in far south-central Texas. And they'll be there for about five months, and so we are so excited. They're going to be leaving this week also, and so we're going to send them forth in prayer and blessing. You know, we're all called to Christian service. Um, all the time, and sometimes specific people are called to go to specific places for a specific time, and we're grateful that the McPhersons and the Knoxes have answered that call. So as we pray, I'm going to ask you to put your hand forward, and we're going to bless them in prayer as we do this. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you so much, Lord, for these people that you have called into mission. Be with them, go with them, be with them in their work. Let everything they do shine with your love and we will be with them in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. It's going to be a great week. Get ready. In the next 21 days, God's going to do something magnificent in your life. Be open to him. Be open to the leading of his spirit. And know that as you do, he's going to give you a new heart. And it's going to beat for him. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.